Today, as we come to the table. You know what happens when you never put yourself in a position where something can happen? Guess what happens? Nothing! It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's when you start thinking, nah, we're mature enough. Just turn the lights out, put on the movie, get the popcorn, sit real close, changing the channels. Suddenly the leg touches the leg. I'm going to stop right there. You know what I'm talking about. If you set up boundaries so nothing can happen, nothing will ever happen. And, and listen, this is not just for before you're married. This works great in marriage. I found that if I don't put myself alone with other women, there's never a temptation to be with another woman. Our culture encourages us to indulge in our sexual desires and lustful passions. We're told to gratify ourselves with whomever we want and whenever we want. But as Christians, we're called to a higher standard when it comes to sex. God created sex, and He designed sex to be between a man and a woman in marriage. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark teaches that because God set the boundaries for sex, you need to adhere to those boundaries. Use wisdom to create strong boundaries for yourself so that you're not put into places and situations that will lead you into temptation. You can be a light to the world by honoring God with your body. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the first book of Thessalonians chapter 4 with today's edition of Come to the Table. What God is saying, what Paul is saying is, make sure that not only you're not acting like the world in the world with all their sexual morality, but make sure that you don't bring it into the doors of the church, especially don't be sexually immoral with a brother or sister in Christ, because when you do that, there's a greater consequence, because God himself will be the avenger. Again, notice here, the word defraud is interesting. It comes with the idea here of taking advantage of a brother or sister sexually. And says, Paul says, whoever does this, if it takes uh, advantage of a brother or sister in a sexual way, God himself will avenge them. This is scary stuff. God says, I take this very personal. Why? You're my family, God would say. Now think about it. It's one thing when you hear about other people's families and their kids being involved in drugs or alcohol or sexual activity or whatever the case might be. Your heart breaks and you love them and you pray for them and your heart's with them and maybe they share and you minister to them. That's one level. But what happens when it's your kids? It's a whole new level. You see, you are God's kids. The world may do that. We shouldn't do it. And if we do, we especially shouldn't be involved in this type of activity among believers. Greater accountability. It's interesting. He says that God himself will avenge this. I mean, it gives this whole thing where there's this, God says, look, this is, this is personal for me. I will, I'm going to deal with those within the body of Christ that take advantage of brothers and sisters. Again, we think the Marvel Avengers are tough. They're nothing compared to the ultimate Avenger who's God. And again, the problem we face today is we live in such a loose world sexually and so readily accept most any kind of sex, whether in marriage or not, that we've lost sight of how serious any deviation from God's plan is to God because our society accepts it and we convince ourselves that it's not that bad. But in God's eyes, it goes against everything he created along with its design, with God's design. And to God, it's not only sin, it's an insult. God says, this is not just something where you're, you're this, something that's a sin against me. I created it a certain way. I'm God Almighty. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a male and a female. I'm going to put it in their DNA. And I'm going to fix it to where they are going to have a wonderful time sexually together once they're married. But anything outside that is wrong. And then mankind comes along in his fallen nature, along with the demonic realm influencing, and says, oh yeah, watch this, and, and pulls it apart. So it's not just sin, it's, it's really, I think, the enemy saying to the Lord, you know, we don't care about you, basically in, in your face, so to speak. And, and so it even goes to a greater level of insult to the Lord. Now note this, when, again, the idea of the word defraud here, 
I want to go a little further with it because the idea here comes with the meaning of, or, or should I say the meaning comes with the idea of taking something that is not rightfully yours to take. Note that, taking something that is not rightfully yours to take. What Paul is saying is we have no right to another person's body until we're married. Their body doesn't belong to us. It hasn't been given to us. And if we interact with their body in some physical way, then we are stealing from them a gift that God gave them. How many of us wish we could go back and have that gift to give our spouse on our wedding day? And yet we can't, can we? Now, some of you that have kept yourselves, praise the Lord. Hang on to it. It's a special, precious gift from God. Quite honestly, I think I could say the majority of us probably haven't done that. And so what that means is something very special God gave for us with our spouse has now been given away to someone else. Does that mean God can't renew? Does that mean God can't hit the refresh button and make it wonderful? No, God can and God does. God is, God is a, what God is, he takes dead things and he resurrects them. That's his specialty. So I'm not giving us kind of this hopeless situation that you're never gonna have joy and this sweetness and newness with your wife or your husband. Of course you will. But this is something so precious that I think Satan sees it as a greater prize when he can defraud and rip off. Listen, the world's one thing, but especially, especially a child of God. It's a greater attack and affront to God when the enemy is able to do that. Here's something deep to think about. And again, we're going to get into some deep things. We've already gotten into deep things this morning. The Bible takes us there, so that's where we're going. But think about this for a moment. The Bible says before time began, God foreordained our days, which means before time began, God picked your husband or your wife. And what that also means, and here's why this is so serious, because if we get physical with anybody other than our husband and or our wife, that means we are with someone that God has not ordained us to be with. We are actually with someone else's future wife or someone else's future husband. And since it's all been laid out by God and everything's eternal, there's an accountability level. I'm not saying that we're guilty of actual physical adultery if we've been in relations before marriage. I'm simply saying that God said, I made her for him and I made him for her. Why are you all together? What are you doing? Now, if you're dating to find out whether or not God's called you together, that's one thing. But here, here's what I would encourage you to do. If you do find yourself in that situation saying, I think that God's bringing us together, and I do believe this is something that's a relationship that God is putting together, then we're going to put up really high boundaries. Let's protect ourselves. Are we free? Sure. Are we grown up? Sure. But let's put up boundaries to make sure that we don't fall physically. Let's really make it a goal to stay pure until the day we say I do. And then, man, how great is this going to be? right? You know, when I gave my life to the Lord again, this is something I said, God set me free, pulled me out of this lifestyle. And so I made up my mind. I said, okay, Lord, you set me free. I'm going to stay pure until I, until I find my wife. And so for three years until I was married, again, waiting on God to restore Tracy and bring us back together. That's the new lifestyle that you're living. That's the way you're living. You're doing it unto the Lord. There's joy and all this. And then Tracy and I, we set up boundaries for our life because again, we know we don't trust the flesh and you should never trust it, you know? And that's when your kids say to you, you don't trust me. The answer to that, mom and dad, is this. You're exactly right. Now, here's what I will say. Here's a, let me give you some encouragement. I do trust your heart. I do trust that you desire to do right. But I don't trust your flesh any more than mine. And my flesh will do stuff it should never do. You being younger and less mature, you're going to do worse. The answer tonight is no. All right? Just being honest, that's how it is. Tracy and I were adults. I knew what my past was like. We said, you know, let's just put up high boundaries. And we did. You have to decide what your boundaries are. But here's what we did. We never put ourselves in a position where something could happen. And you know what happens when you never put yourself in a position where something can happen? Guess what happens? Nothing. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's when you start thinking, nah, we're mature enough. Just turn the lights out, put on the movie, get the popcorn, sit real close, changing the channels. Suddenly the leg touches the leg. I'm going to stop right there. You know what I'm talking about. If you set up boundaries so nothing can happen, nothing will ever happen. And, and listen, this is not just for before you're married. This works great in marriage. I found that if I don't put myself alone with other women, there's never a temptation to be with another woman because she's not there. It's pretty simple. It's really not complicated. But we have to make those decisions. But now you see why it's so important to understand why Paul says here 
in this passage, notice he says this. He says, because the Lord is the avenger of such, we also forewarned you and testified. Forewarn has a strong intensity in the Greek language. It comes with a greater intensity. And what it means is, is that, look, you need to know how serious sexual activity outside of marriage is, and you especially need to know how serious sexual activity with the body of Christ and among God's kids is. It's even a higher accountability level. Don't defraud each other in this. And if you have defrauded each other in this, listen, ask forgiveness. Today can be a day of repentance. Today can be a day of restoration. God forgives. God restores. You're not hopeless. God is merciful. He's gracious. He's the lifter of our head. He wipes our shame away. And that's the God we serve. Paul says, let that be you. He says, verse 7, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. In other words, the world lives that way, but here's how we're to live. We're not to live unclean like the world. We are God's children. We live holy unto God. That means set apart for God. Now look at verse 8. Therefore, this is heavy. He who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying, look, I recognize that I'm writing by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God. Anything the Bible says and you read it to someone and they get upset about it, it's not you they're really upset at, is it? It's God. Let me ask you this. How many verses of the Bible did you guys write? Anybody, if you wrote a verse of the Bible, just lift your hand. We're gonna pray for you for being a liar. <laughs> we didn't write the Bible. Some of you, maybe, maybe, maybe this makes you uncomfortable. I can't believe you're saying that. I didn't write this. I didn't go, you know what, guys, I've got a lot of opinions and viewpoints, and I'm going to stand up here and share them with all of you now. If you're, if you're like me, you'd get up and walk out. Like, I don't care about your viewpoints and opinions. Big deal. I've got them too. So Paul says, I recognize that when I lay this out, there's going to be some people in society that say, Paul, that's your opinion. Paul, that's what you think. He says, no, no. I want you to know by the authority of God Almighty that I recognize I'm being moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is not something that I have said. This is not something man has said. This is something God Almighty has said. Paul puts it with the greatest authority possible, showing again that this is God's word. It's God's authority. He did it. It wasn't Paul's idea. It's God's idea. And God's the creator of the universe and the ultimate judge of all things. Paul was indeed an apostle, but God's word trumps all, including apostles. And so Paul's making the point that God is the final authority. This isn't, I didn't come up with it. It's God Almighty. And then he adds something even heavier here. Because he says if we reject it, the word reject here is an interesting word. It means to make something invalid. It's just, like, nah, it doesn't count, doesn't matter, it means nothing. It's completely wrong. He says, if you reject this, you're making God invalid. You're making God's word invalid. That's a scary thing. He's saying, I didn't say this. God said it. And don't make the word of God in your viewpoint something that's invalid, that doesn't matter. Because again, an insult to God and very scary on that day we stand before the Lord and just say, well, Lord, you know what? Your word didn't mean anything to me. It didn't matter. I decided to do what I wanted anyway. So Paul, again, why would Paul put such a heavy verse at the end of that section? I think, again, to drive home the point that it's not just Paul's opinion. Because remember, the Thessalonians lived in an environment much like ours today. It was a very sexually immoral environment. And now he changes gears and turns a corner here. Notice this. He finished talking about the way the world does things in what they call love, but it's really lust and sexual immorality. And he says to the church now, look at verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, that is among us, the family of God, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. I love this. Paul makes this, again, contrast between sexual immorality of the world and the brotherly love in the church, because the world's going to do things opposite than we do. Uh, Theirs is based on personal gain and pleasure. Ours is based on love one for another. But Paul says, I don't have to teach you this. You know why? I can, and it's good, but God himself will do it. I love that. And how does God do it? By the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. So God teaches us to love each other. You know, something I found, you know, I had love in my heart. When I gave my life to the Lord, I had love for people I didn't even know. It just happens. God gives us love for the body of Christ. And, and the world, really, just gives us love. But as we grow in the Lord, what happens? We grow in love. We grow in love. And Paul addresses this here. Notice what he says. He says, he says indeed, you do so. In other words, I see that you are loving each other. Uh, you, you do so toward the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase. Here it is, that abounding again, more and more. Remember earlier Paul said, I know you're growing in the Lord, but I want you to increase and abound in the Lord. Now Paul says, I know you love each other and you're growing in love, but I want you to abound in your growth in love. Pray for God to make you a person of love. You ever pray that prayer? I want to encourage you. If you don't pray that prayer, pray it. 
You might say, I am a loving person. Let me ask you this. How many of you are satisfied with how well you love? I'm not. I'm not satisfied with how well I love. I see my deficiencies. I want to love you better. I want to love my wife better. I've got a long way to go there. I've grown a lot, but I've got a long way to go there, truly. To love my kids better, to love the lost better, a long way. We need to be growing. Pray. And I do this on a regular basis. Lord, make me a man of love. Now, women don't pray that. Make me a woman of love, but you get my point. Make me a man of love. Let me grow in my love. And the neat thing is God answers it, and you begin to feel a genuine heartfelt. It's not this, oh, I need to love them because they're my brother. There's a genuine heartfelt love for people. It's, it's a wonderful thing that God does. Ask God to do it. And Paul says here, you, we need to be abounding in this. We need to be growing in this. And the word love here is the word agape, which means to love others more than we love ourselves. And so Paul is saying that God by his spirit teaches us to love others more than we love ourselves. And again, you know as well as I do, this is supernatural. It does not happen naturally. It's something God has to do. But he goes on now and finishes these last few verses with giving them some exhortations. It's almost like this shotgun approach to a bunch of exhortations, okay? I've told you that, and here's some final capper exhortations on this. Verse 11, first of all, that you aspire to lead a quiet life. Now, what does Paul mean by this? Again, inspiring to live a quiet life. It doesn't mean that we don't share our faith openly or vocally or keep ourselves busy for the kingdom, but it does mean that we don't cause unnecessary problems for ourselves. How many Christians cause unnecessary problems? What do I mean by that? Certainly you want to be a witness for the Lord, but you don't have to stand up in the middle of a hostile crowd toward the things of God and say, you're all going to hell and you need to repent now or God's going to judge you forever. You're causing trouble for yourself that's unnecessary if you do that. Okay, that's what Paul's talking about. He's not saying don't live vocally, don't live out openly. He's saying make sure that you don't cause trouble for yourself. Don't be the person that's causing the problem all the time. Now, if it's because of the gospel, so be it, if you're doing it in love. But make sure you're not the one yelling at people or, or wearing the turn or burn, you know, um, uh, you know, little pin on your jacket, like I saw a guy wear one time, or the bumper sticker. Listen, I understand they probably know the Lord and love the Lord, but you don't understand you're creating problems for yourself and driving people away. Paul says, no need to do that. Live a quiet life. The next thing he says, mind your own business. Now, what a great one that is, isn't it? <laughs> now, that's great when you're telling somebody else that. You don't like it when you're told that, right? If I tell somebody else, mind your own business, that just kind of feels righteous, doesn't it? And somebody says to me, Mark, mind your own business. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. And then I'll start thinking about whether or not I'm really justified, you know. Well, man, maybe I'm justified, maybe I'm not, whatever. But I try to justify it, right? He says, mind your own business. Look, we have enough to worry about with our own life without being a busybody in everybody else's life. This goes in line with gossip and all those other things, you know. Did you hear? And well, maybe I don't need to hear, you know. He says, mind your own business. And then he says, this is, this is the one where I said a little bit of the governmental idea that we'll get into more in 2 Thessalonians. He said, and work with your own hands. Notice this. He says, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. It's not just to be, we should be people that are working, but we're commanded to work. Again, the personal governing of our life. And also, this would apply to the national governing of a nation. You're not going to find a nation where people are not working that's going to be prosperous or successful. It just doesn't work. It always collapses. And as followers of God, the Bible says we're called to be those who work hard and are responsible for our lives. And Paul gives several reasons. One is we're commanded to. He says, this is God's design for us. You know, one of the consequences in the garden was the fall was now we have to work by the sweat of our brow, right? And so, but God says there's more reasons than that. It's not just because of the fall that we're commanded to do it. There is a consequence, but there's a greater reason. And that is we are contributing to society. You're contributing. You're being a helper. You're being a part. Not only that, if you're working faithfully, you don't have time to be a busybody. <laughs> you know, if you have too much time on your hands, there's all kinds of problems that creates. But another reason is because one of God's main governing commands for mankind is not only that we're responsible to provide for ourselves, but we're responsible to provide for our families and get this, even others if we can when necessary. How wonderful to be responsible enough with your own finances that if you see a brother or sister in need, you can help them. And you guys do that. Ask the tithe counters. There'll be an envelope for so-and-so. And somehow they knew there was a need. Maybe God just put it on their heart, whatever the case might be. So you're doing that. But if you aren't working, if you aren't having an income, if you aren't providing for yourself and your own family, how are you going to help anybody else that's in need? This is the ultimate call of the believer. Responsible to family, but helping others as well. 
Again, where do we see this principle? We'll get more into it again in 2 Thessalonians, but 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says this, for even when we were with you, Paul saying to them in Thessalonica, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither should he eat. Again, it's a biblical principle. It's not just that we can be responsible, but the bottom line is it's because it's God's design. And God says, I'm going to be so serious about this. If there's someone that refuses to work, don't feed them. Wow, Mark, that seems harsh, doesn't it? We have to take that up with God. Again, did I write that verse? Did you write that verse? God wrote that verse. Why would God do that? Because God knows the propensity of mankind to get out of work if he can. And so God says, no, I'm going to command it. You need to be working to provide for yourself, to provide for others, and also to provide for those that are in need. And he says, that's what I'll bless. Again, this is uh, something that wouldn't be received very well in our culture today because it may sound harsh to them, but again, God has his reasons that we'd be productive. And again, Paul's not talking about certain seasons where we're without work or not able to work. That's different. He's speaking of a long-term lifestyle. And then Paul finishes it up with the last last couple of cappers on that whole idea. Uh, he says, uh, again, we're supposed to work, and, and the first is because it's a good example and a testimony to the unsaved, that is, we're to be responsible to work. And notice he says that the last, he says, you're a testimony to those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. So it's for the testimony and witness of others and also that you may lack nothing. Heavy stuff today, guys, as we wrap this up. Heavy stuff. I want to encourage you, be responsible for yourself. Be responsible for your family. Try to find yourself in a way that you can organize your life in such a financial way that not only can you provide for your needs, but that you can provide for the needs of others. And again, what a great time that is now when many people are struggling, right? But the biggest thing I want to leave us with today is sexual purity. And I want to say this first. Look, if we've covered these things and you've been convicted and you're going, oh my goodness, I feel guilty on this, let the conviction do what it's supposed to do, but conviction is not supposed to condemn you. How do you know the difference in conviction and Satan's attack? Satan's attack is condemnation. Conviction is, oh my goodness, I need to get this right. If you're under condemnation this morning for how you've lived in the past sexually, that's the enemy, ignore that. But if you're under conviction this morning saying, you know what, I need to make this right before God. And you might even need to make it right before man. There were some phone calls I made after I came to Christ. And although they were still in the world, and I can remember kind of the bewildered voice on the other end when I said, will you please forgive me of taking something that didn't belong to me? Well, it was okay. No big deal. No, it was a big deal. I want to ask your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Sure. They didn't care. But God cares. And between God and I, we care. There may be something God's going to ask you to do beyond asking forgiveness. There may be a phone call or two you need to make. Now, don't do something if it's going to open up a door that doesn't need to be opened. And I certainly wouldn't do anything as a married couple that your husband or wife doesn't know about. God will lead and give you wisdom. My heart is this. Don't leave her condemned. If you're convicted, don't leave her convicted either. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to purify you. And let God cleanse you and fill you with his joy of forgiveness. Because that's what it is. He's the lifter of your head. He wipes away all shame. But if you're in a situation where you're now in the middle of sexual immorality, I want to encourage you to repent this morning. God is speaking directly to our hearts by his word. I didn't plan this. This is just where we are. I didn't write this. God wrote it. Let's let God do in our heart what he wants to do and let's respond to it. Thanks for joining us today on Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. Pastor Mark is teaching verse by verse through the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians. In this letter, the Apostle Paul teaches the early Christians to live holy and blameless lives by being sexually pure. Back in those days of Roman influence, much like it is in our culture today, people freely indulged their sexual desires and lustful passions. In such a culture, one of the most powerful ways Christians can display the holiness of God is to abide by God's design for sex which is between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage. We encourage you to reflect God's holiness in this way. If you have any questions or prayer requests, we'd love to hear from you and pray with you. You can give us a call at 865-609-1385. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Once again, that's 865-609-1385. Come to the Table is a ministry based out of Calvary, Knoxville in Knoxville, Tennessee. If you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love for you to come to Calvary, Knoxville this Sunday. We want to meet you. Feel free to refer to our website for service times, thewaymedia.net. 
Scroll down the page and find a link to Calvary Knoxville. As our time comes to a close today, we trust that you've been encouraged through this teaching of 1 Thessalonians. Please make a point to join us next time as Pastor Mark continues to teach biblical truths and practical applications on living out the Christian faith from this New Testament book here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.